So, the crisis in Zimbabwe is described in many different ways. It's described as humanitarian, economic, political, social, and public health. And you can see already that just in describing the crisis, you have to use several different disciplines. But just to give you an idea of the scope, I'm going to read this quote to you that I found in a newspaper article. The situation is very serious in Zimbabwe when life expectancy goes from 60 years to just over 30 years in a 15-year span. It's a meltdown. It's not just a crisis. It's a meltdown. And here's some statistics from my research. You can see that life expectancy drops from 60 to 34 in nearly 10 years. So this is a pretty significant crisis. And my research in looking at the crisis in Zimbabwe, what I wanted to do is I wanted to investigate three things. First of all, I wanted to know the causes of the crisis and why it got so bad. Secondly, I wanted to understand the role of development. Was it positive? Was it negative? Was it effective, ineffective, and why? And then I wanted to make a statement about how development should move forward in the future. I felt that this was very interdisciplinary for reasons I've already stated. The crisis is very interdisciplinary. But also, the concept of development is extremely interdisciplinary within itself, and it involves many aspects of society. Also, it's a concept that's highly contested and debated. So there isn't one definition of what development is that's correct or incorrect, and a lot of scholars argue over what the de definition of development actually is. So the methods that I used, I did a literature review of books, um, journals, and newspaper articles, and I included six disciplines in my study. So I used history, political science, economics, anthropology, sociology, and education. And I felt all of these were necessary to get an idea of what was happening in Zimbabwe. So if you would ask most people, why is Zimbabwe in a crisis? They would probably tell you this. It's the fault of President Robert Mugabe. And that's what I found in a lot of articles and even scholarly journals. But Mugabe is an interesting figure because if you would have read publications about Mugabe in the 1980s, you would have read something like this. Mugabe is one of Africa's most well-educated, well even-tempered, politically savvy leaders committed to racial reconciliation. But if you would read publications about Mugabe today, they would say Mugabe is corrupt, ruthless, power-hungry, paranoid, clueless, insane, and has single-handedly destroyed the country of Zimbabwe. So either Mugabe's character has changed dramatically over the course of 30 years, or there's more to the story. And indeed, I found that there's a lot more to the story. And these portrayals of Mugabe are taking a very one-dimensional perspective on the crisis and often are inaccurate. So using a multi-causal analysis, I found a lot of reasons that Zimbabwe is in a crisis right now. First of all, the history of colonialism has created structures that are very destructive and devastating for the country. And one of these is a severe wealth inequality along racial lines, where 1% of the population owns most of the businesses and the land in the country. Also, international policies have exacerbated this problem because they've, in, they've favored the wealthy and multinational corporations over Zimbabwe's poor. And also, neo-colonialism was established with the Lancaster House Constitution in 1980 when Zimbabwe was founded. Also, there have been development agendas that have been destructive and contributed to the crisis. There's also an ideological disagreement, be mostly between Robert Mugabe and the United States and Europe, that's contributed to the crisis. So the role of development in all this I used the interdisciplinary strategy of advancing through checks and balances for this part of the paper, and I looked at three development agendas that I found to be prominent in Zimbabwe. The first one is neoliberalism, or market-driven development, and this is something that's advocated by the IMF, the World Bank, and the UN, usually. I also looked at state-centered development that's based on socialism, because this is what was advocated by the Mugabe regime. And his ver version of socialism was called left nationalism. And I also looked at the role of non-governmental organizations. They argue for a more participatory approach in development, which involves the local, po the local community in decision making, and also development from the bottom up. So they focus on one small community and then hope that these changes will affect the broader society. And what I found was that development in Zimbabwe has largely failed or been ineffective. And these are the reasons why I think they've been ineffective. All three strategies have ignored the needs and desires of 
certain, certain portions of the Zimbabwean population. Also, they've implemented universal values, norms, and ideologies without considering the unique history and context of the nation. And also, they've advanced the interests of the wealthy and the powerful at, ex at the expense of the opinions of the poor. And specifically, neoliberalism was probably the most destructive. It created a lot of problems that Zimbabwe has yet to recover from. The state-centered development policies of Mugabe, they were often violent and uneven, but they actually worked and benefited some of the, pop the, the, benefited some of the poorer populations. But they were severely limited by the Lancaster House Constitution, and they were punished by informal and formal sanctions from the UN. Also, non-governmental organizations I found to be very ineffective. They weren't participatory or bottom-up, even when they claimed to be. And they excluded the poorest and most marginalized portions of the population, even when they claimed that they target them. Now, so far, my analysis has been pretty negative about Zimbabwe and about development. But I do have some exceptions to this overall rule of failure of development in Zimbabwe. I found three programs that were moderately successful. They were all NGO-based, and all of them seemed to avoid these pitfalls that other programs kept finding themselves in. And they were very diverse. They dealt with a lot of different communities. They, there was a lot of different actors involved, different donors. Everything was different. And they even had a lot of different goals. But they had one thing in common, and that was this, training for transformation. This is a workshop that's based on critical pedagogy. And I, I think that because this was the only commonality I could find in these programs, that this is probably a good indication that this is the reason why they were successful. Um, and I don't think it was just the workshop itself, because the workshop was done with the local population. But I also think that it's these principles of critical pedagogy that were in pedagogy that was embraced by not only the local population, but the donors and the actors involved that made these programs successful. So I thought that if maybe we could use the um, interdisciplinary strategy of extension and apply these principles from critical pedagogy to all forms of participatory development in Zimbabwe, we might have a way to move forward. So I call this hybrid of critical pedagogy and participatory development. Participatory development through critical learning and praxis. And there's four main principles. First, we need to eliminate the teacher-student dichotomy, or in development, it's the expert and poor person. There's not one person that teaches and one person that learns, but both parties come into the conversation with a lot to learn and things that they can contribute and things that they can teach. Once that, di that dichotomy is eliminated, then both parties can engage in an ongoing critical dialogue about real experiences and problems, not only describing these problems, but also determining what are the causes and trying to find creative solutions on how to address them and confront them. And then we need to really allow these terms that we like to use, like development, empowerment, participatory, to be redefined and revisited by the local population themselves so they can decide what that means to them. And then, once that's done, finally, the both parties can engage in critical action, not only to solve practical problems, but to also confront powerful interests. So, in summary, President Robert Mugabe is often demonized and blamed unfairly for Zimbabwe's problems. And many factors have contributed to the crisis, including some development strategies. Also, development in Zimbabwe has been largely ineffective, but participatory development seems promising for Zimbabwe, but it needs to include some of these principles from pr critical pedagogy. And then I wanted to conclude with this um, quote which I felt was one of the major things that I'm personally taking out of this research. I felt like this sums it up well, if I can get to it. Any attempt at a complete definition of development, what it is and how it can be achieved, and therefore how it ought to be pursued is bound to fail. Any new approach attempting to overcome the development impasse must necessarily be open-ended. I'll take any questions. <laughs> Like the house, like other nations around Zimbabwe that could be affecting 
like immediately around Zimbabwe or? Yeah, immediately. Um, that's a good question. I think that Zimbabwe is a landlocked country, so that has a little bit to do with the way that it develops. But I think that South Africa has played a big role in Zimbabwe's development, especially recently as Robert Mugabe has become less and less popular in the West and more and more of like this figure to be um, criticized. South Africa has really stepped up and defended Mugabe in a lot of ways, as has other African countries. Um, they, they look at M Robert Mugabe a lot different than we do in the United States. And I think that has an impact, because that's probably one of the reasons that he's still in power. How did you get involved in this question? Um, that's a, well, I lived in Uganda for a year, which isn't Zimbabwe at all. But I got interested in Zimbabwe. I did a research paper in like intro to African history. And I started reading some of this literature. And I mean, some of the things they were saying about the president was just kind of remarkable to me, especially since you know Zimbabwe gained independence in 1980. And yet, all of the problems are Robert Mugabe's fault. And that just seemed like such a glaringly obvious bias, in my opinion. But there were scholarly journals and, and scholars that were claiming this. And so that sort of is what got me interested. And I just got more and more interested in learning about the history and learning about the inequality. And I was just hooked after that, I think. So I really wanted to understand why. Yeah. From an economic perspective, most economists will argue that socialism doesn't work in the long term and that market-driven economies really are the way to go. Do you think it's lack of opportunity? that's given to the poor in Zim Zimbabwe versus the actual developmental structures that you've talked about? Well, I think um, neoliberalism, like I, I can't speak to market-driven development broadly for like every nation in the world. I, my, my research was very focused on just Zimbabwe, and I think the reason why it was so destructive is because of the history of colonialism. Mm -hmm. Because you have 1% of the population that owns pretty much all of the businesses. And the businesses they don't own are owned by multinational corporations. And they own 50% of the land. And so when you have policies that favor business, really they're favoring businesses that are located in other countries or businesses that are owned by people that are already very wealthy. So um, a lot of what neoliberalism did in Zimbabwe was it took away some of the price subsidies on food and health care. Zimbabwe actually had one of the most sophisticated healthcare systems in, on the continent in the 80s until neoliberalism um, privatized the system and it was pretty much decimated at that point. And unfortunately, that's when HIV was really becoming a pandemic in the region as well. So you can see how those factors sort of created this mix of social chaos, really. And so I think it's the unique history of Zimbabwe that makes it really not a good option, in my opinion. Um, and the social, I'm not saying that socialism would be the best option either. I mean, Robert Mugabe's policies overall haven't worked, but they've worked a lot better than market-driven development, and that's just based on facts and um, figures. You know, when you're looking at how did it impact the poor, um, his land resettlement program is probably the most controversial thing that he did in the name of socialism. But um, one, I think it was one million poor Zimbabwe's were re what poor Zimbabwean residents were resettled during that time. So it did have an impact. Now, I mean, it was ethnically biased and it excluded women. I mean, there's problems with it, but it was more effective than neoliberalism, which, you know, was very destructive, so. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bodger, did you want to say anything before we move on? She said everything. She said everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you taught her well. Uh, so Earth, yeah, we also want to present Jeannie with an honor cord. She completed the INGS honors requirements, which means she took particular courses, and she did her capstone project for honors credit before credits. So at graduation, she's graduating magna cum laude, which yeah. is the highest honor.